Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's episode, host Casey Hinches looks at a couple of drought-tolerant plants with multi-season beauty. We visit with the Oklahoma Secretary of Agriculture, Jim Reese, about a unique garden at the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry building. While there, market coordinator Micah Anderson shows how they use some novel tools and techniques in their garden. Extension turf grass specialist Dennis Martin has tips for identification and control of crabgrass. And assistant extension specialist Shelly Mitchell has a great garden activity for children. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. There are about 20 species of the genus Amsonia, and I want to introduce you to a couple of them. This is Amsonia hubrechtii. It gets about three feet tall and about three feet wide, maybe a little taller. Um, and this one is well known uh, for its foliage. It's got a very fine foliage to it. Its common name is needle leaf Amsonia or blue star. The other common name blue star comes from these light blue star-shaped flowers that it has. It's a great drought tolerant plant, very upright perennial. Um, it will tend to flop a little bit later in the season, so after it blooms, we're going to cut it back about six inches. Now, in the fall, it'll have this beautiful golden tone to the foliage, and it's a great plant to add to your garden. Here we have another Ansonia. This is a cultivar called Blue Ice. While the parentage isn't exactly known. Um, it, it's very similar and was actually discovered next to Amsonia Tabernay Montana. It has a very similar look. Uh, you can see that the foliage isn't quite as fine as the other Amsonia. It's got a little bit more of a lanceolate leaf to it. It does have the same star blue shaped flower. Uh, this one is actually a little bit darker though, so that's the nice thing about this cultivar Blue Ice. It also stays shorter, um, only growing about a foot to a foot and a half tall, which makes it really nice for a border plant. Again, both of these Amsonias are very drought tolerant. Um, they do well in rock gardens. And this one, because it's compact, it won't flop on you as much as the other Amsonia. These are both great plants and I'd highly recommend them for your garden. Today we're here at the Department of Ag and I'm with Secretary Reese. Um, you are the Secretary of Agriculture here for the state of Oklahoma right. and I appreciate you joining me. And we're in the Department of Ag trial gardens here. Can you tell me a little bit about this garden and how it got established? Well, in 2011, it's the, the you know the cost of maintaining the grounds, and, uh -huh. and uh, we had some decorations and some different plants and things out here, but nothing really productive. It was all just landscaping and for the eye. And we said, no, we'll go ahead and take it over. We'll take care of it for you, and we'll grow some demonstration gardens, grow some crops that we grow in Oklahoma, and grow some gardening uh, items. And uh -huh. it's just been outstanding. It's been fun. It's been educational. We have frequently have international groups come visit um, our building and, 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 our, and what we do here. Mm -hmm. And we get to show them all the crops we grow uh, plus gardening. In the whole state of Oklahoma. Well, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, the, during the summer, you can't show them winter wheat well. <laughs> but, or canola. But right. for the most part, we show them the milo and the corn and the soybeans and the and, and things that we don't grow a lot of, but we can show them what a plant is. Right. And 
for those that come from other countries, they just like seeing that. Yeah. And they don't have to travel the entire state to see, go down to lo, uh, Southwest or North Central to see cotton. You can see cotton here. Right. And uh, so it's, it's very educational. Educational for people who even here in the building who haven't seen all the crops that we grow in Oklahoma. Right. It, it's a fascinating garden and I think it really highlights uh, the intensity of how much food you can grow in a small garden. Um, you guys have a lot of crops growing here behind you and you're about to add one more. Uh, cumin. Uh, We're going to try cumin this year. Mm -hmm. We have a spice company out of Chicago that came and visited with us and said, you know, we'd like to know if we can grow cumin on a large scale in, in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. And so uh, we said, sure, we'd try it. And there's, we have some farmers that'll try it. But w if you give us some seeds, we'll put it in this garden. And so we're gonna try some, growing some cumin. And um, you know, who knows, it might be a, a, a future cash crop and sell spices, certainly probably be a higher value crop than, than a lot of the commodities that we grow. So. We're all for it. Right. I mean, this garden is very diverse, and I appreciate you sharing it with us and taking the time. Thank you, Secretary Reese. Thank you. It's early May in Oklahoma, and many people's thoughts turn to caring for their lawn. Whether you've got a cool season grass like tall fescue or a warm season grass like Bermuda grass, Crabgrass can be a frequent problem in both of these types of lawns. Here we'd like to show you some crabgrass that's germinated and will soon become a problem for us. One thing that I'd like to emphasize in early May is that if one's serious about getting crabgrass post-emergent control, that is control the plant after it's emerged, now is really the time to act. Unfortunately, in many years, folks will call the extension service members in the middle of summer and the plant is already several feet across and there's very little that can be done at that time. So if one is wanting to take action against this uh, voracious summer annual weed, now's the time to do it. Here we see crabgrass at just the uh, first tiller stage. Uh, there's a daughter tiller coming off the main plant. But as we look at this area of thin turf, we can also see crabgrass at just the two leaf stage or even at the one leaf stage. So the point being that crabgrass continues to germinate throughout the warm period of the summer. Frequently you'll hear people saying, oh it's too late to put down a pre-emergent herbicide. Throughout most of Oklahoma's growing season, nothing could be further from the truth because once the crabgrass has germinated at least the first part of the population, it grows and covers over an area. So if you want to control the existing plants, you use a post-emergent crabgrass killer. However, once the crabgrass that it had germinated is killed out, there's still more seed in the soil. So we do need that pre-emergent herbicide in place. Thus, if you've missed the optimum timing for the first application of what we call the split program, you can still get some measure of success for later germinating crabgrass. So in early May, consider doing a post-emergent crabgrass application to kill out the existing plants that have emerged, and then also do a pre-emergent uh, application to guard against additional crabgrass aris arising from seed. Now the consumer ha has a couple different products that can be used for post-emergent control. One is amazoquin, uh, the active ingredient in image, and then also quinclorac, the active ingredient in a product such as Drive or in some of the major box store three-way mixes of both post-emergent broadleaf and also post-emergent grass herbicides. Now with any of these, the addition of a non-ionic surfactant can help in post-emergent control. When we say non-ionic surfactant, that's a specialty type of surfactant that usually can be bought from a chemical company distributor, but you typically will not find it in the box store. A non-ionic surfactant is not the same as dishwashing liquid. In fact, dishwashing liquid sometimes will inactivate the active ingredients in a post-emergent herbicide. So if you don't have a non-ionic surfactant, it's oftentimes better to even skip the soap addition. So think about now is the time in early May to do post-emergent crabgrass control and also have that second application, or maybe in your case, even the first application of pre-emergent for successful crabgrass control in the lawn.
We're here at the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture in their demonstration garden and joining me today is Micah Anderson, the Marketing Development Coordinator and also the man responsible for planting the demonstration garden. Micah, we've got some sweet potatoes that you have planted here. Can you tell me about the process that you went through? Well, we uh, made a raised bed with our, with our little tractor and uh, made the raised bed and then we laid down irrigation tape and uh, drip irrigation. We put two lines in because we made a fairly wide bed. And then we overlaid the, the bed with uh, plastic. <clears throat> and there's different widths of these plastics. This one is a, we used a five foot because we needed a wider bed. And we rolled it out and, and shoveled the dirt out and by hand. Okay. And, and, uh, and this is fairly thin plastic, so it molds nicely to the raised bed that you've created. Um, how did you decide, how did you actually go about planting the sweet potatoes in there? Well, you used a pretty nifty tool there. Well, we used a, a little paint stick that, uh, you know, because you, uh, I'm an old uh, body technician that paint cars or whatever, but we just made the hole that way. That way it makes a smaller hole. But you use a stick to, to kind of punch it in and loosen the dirt up, and then you take it and put the root down into the soil and then press the soil against it. That way you got a very minimum hole and the plastic uh, is there, it's gonna give you the weed control. The bigger the hole, then more weeds that you got a chance of coming in there. The smaller the hole, less weeds. So uh, we wanna make the hole as small as we can, so that's what we did. And then you also use that measuring stick, or that paint stick as a measuring stick yeah, as well. Yeah, because it's just about the right size, it's about a foot long, and so it gives us a good spacing. Uh, you plant potatoes, sweet potatoes, you can plant them a foot apart, you can plant them a foot and a half, according to how thick you want, how big you want them to get, and how long you're going to leave them in the ground. And, and why did you choose to plant sweet potatoes in plastic? Well, uh, because they're tropical and they lack a lot of heat, and this black plastic really warms the soil up. And uh, this is a, a year that I've never seen it being this cool. But with the black plastic, they won't suffer nearly as much. They'll, they'll start growing a lot faster because with the black plastic, it's like getting in a black car. And the sun hits it and it really warms it up. And it'll warm this soil up and bring the temperature up really fast. Right, okay. And so it'll, they'll take off. Okay, and, and you've got several different crops that you're growing in here. And so uh, explain a little bit, how would you water each uh, bed differently? Yeah, uh, most of this stuff here we water close to the same. We got the sweet potatoes here, peppers, or tomatoes, or corn, uh, p uh, Irish potatoes, and then lettuce and kale, uh, in the, well, cabbage and kale. But now if I had okra out here, I would definitely water it different. I would okay. shut the water off and not water nearly as much as I would this other stuff. But all of this is on one zone and you've got ball valves on yeah. the end of each zone. So you could water each row differently yeah. if need be. Yeah, and I, actually, I'm probably gonna shut those rows off over there and, and water this by itself because it's not been watered yet. Right, it's To get it planted. soaked. Okay, so Micah, we're at the end of our line here and a lot of times you'll see where you can buy uh, closed caps to end the irrigation line. You've got a simple tip for us right here. What do? Well, I just, we just tie a knot in the end of it, and usually I tie a double knot, but uh, if you tie a knot here, and it will stop the water, and you'll still get a little leak at the end. But what's nice about that is, when I turn the water on, I can come down here and see the water dripping. Mm -hmm. And if I see water dripping at the end, then I know water's coming all the way through my line. But if it's not, then I may have a leak somewhere. Excellent, and one last thing, you're adding fertilizer as a water soluble fertilizer because there's no way to get it into the soil right now other than through the water. Right, and uh, it, it just, uh, and we, we added some amendments to begin with and we had the soil test it and we, we run a little high pH here but we put a little sulfur down begin, at the beginning of the season but as times go along, as every week we'll add a little fertilizer and it seems to keep the plants lively and, and growing really well. Excellent. Thank you, Micah, for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, when you're planting seeds, sometimes it's hard to see the actual seeds and you might lose your place. So what a lot of people do is either buy a seed tape or make a seed tape. So one thing you can check on the packages on the back, it tells you how far apart to sew them. So like this is six inches apart. 
So rather than take these little seeds, which are tiny and black, and drop them into dark soil and lose where you planted them, you can just glue them to a seed tape and then you can take them out to the garden and not worry about it because the spacing will be fine. So what you have to do is, these said six inches apart, so you can start one and you can just use regular glue. It's okay, it'll look a little much there. And then measure six inches to the next one. And if you want to, you can plant a couple and that way if one doesn't come up, you'll have a spare. If both of them come up, you'll just have to trim the extra one so it's not too crowded. And you just go down as far as you need planting your seeds. And then when this dries, you can just take it out to the garden. So you can even prepare these well in advance. Like if you're, if you're inside on a winter day and you want something to do, you can get your garden ready. Just go ahead and space it out. And as long as you let it dry out, they won't start sprouting. All right. And this is just newspaper that I tore into strips. You can bury the whole thing and it'll all disintegrate. The glue won't, won't do anything to hurt the seeds. So that's as many seeds as I have or I want. And I can just tear that and take that out to the garden and just put however deep it says. It says a half inch deep. So I put a half inch of soil on top of this and then just water it. And they're already spaced out perfectly. I don't have to worry about dropping them in soil where I can't see the seeds. And they just use as many as I needed. It's also good with kids. Like if you're using really tiny seeds, like radish seeds, but a cool thing, a cool thing you can do with kids, if you don't know about it, the Junior Master Gardener program has curriculum for grades three through eight, but you can scale it up or down. And in the Learn, Grow, Eat, and Go, which is about getting kids to grow some produce and try it, is a page on garden planting chart. And they actually plant using paper towels. And this chart tells you how many of seeds per paper towel to plant. So it's basically square foot gardening. So for radishes, 16 seeds per square foot. Well, the good thing is most paper towels are approximately a square foot. So that makes it easy. And if you've got like third graders and they're doing math and you're talking about fractions, you can talk about how are we gonna space 16 seeds evenly in a square foot? Well, if you fold it in half, that makes two squares. Fold it in half again, how many does that make? Four. Fold it in half again, you've got eight. And in half again is 16. Now when you open it up, you have 16 equally spaced divisions. All right? And so you can just put a drop of glue in the middle of each one put two or three radish seeds that would otherwise fall into the soil and not make it nice and spaced. Put a couple of seeds on each middle. And again, it's okay, this is gonna decompose in the soil. If you've got heavy clay soil, it might actually add a teeny bit of organic matter and help things out. And you just keep planting until you've got the whole paper towel covered. And then when it's dry, you just take it outside and plant it in the garden. So you just put a little bit of dirt over all this and then they're perfectly spaced. The other good thing is if you have a whole classroom full of kids wanting to plant and some want to plant tomatoes and some want to plant corn, you can talk about the tall things need to be in the back, the back being the north, so they can find out which way is north and that way the tall things won't shade out the small things. And if you do paper towel gardening, and you find out that radishes need 16 per square foot, so you plant those. And tomatoes need one per paper towel. You can put one in the middle. Make sure that the kids who plant tomatoes have theirs out back. And so what you can actually do is in the classroom, everybody gets their paper towel and whatever they want to grow, and you can lay them on the floor and say, okay, all the short things need to be in the front and the taller things in the back, and you can actually plot out where things are gonna go in the garden. And then everybody takes their paper towel straight out to the garden, lays it down, make sure that nothing's blocking anything else, and then cover it up, and you're done. And everything's spaced perfectly, and you learn fractions at the same time.
So, Micah, you've shown us how to lay plasticulture the manual way. You've got a machine here that is pretty nifty in small spaces. Can you tell me about this tractor? Well, this is a uh, BCS tractor that made in Italy, uh, and it's a walk-behind, and they, they're the, the largest company in the world that make walk-behind farm equipment. Uh, and it's, it, just, it does every, pretty much everything that a big tractor will do, except it, you, know, it, you can't get a front end loader for it. But <laughs> it actually uh, plows, this is actually a plow that can plow sod, and then you have the rototiller. And, and this plow is actually what we used just um, to make, earlier to make a raised bed. Yeah, and it's really nice for making raised beds uh, or just for initial, initial plowing the soil up. Okay, so you, you kind of made a windrow going one side and then you made a windrow the other side and that's what made your raised bed. Right. Um, and so what makes this, obviously it's very small and compact, but how is it to maneuver in the garden? Well, it, it's just really a, a great space saver. And if you can, you can see how now this garden is, is a fairly, you know, it's a decent sized garden. It'd be probably a big for a backyard garden but it's a small for a field. Mm -hmm. And if I had my big tractor in here, we would lose almost half the space because you couldn't go to the end. But with this, you can go all the way to the end and it, uh, it, you can get right up close. It'd be great for somebody growing inside of a hoop house because you can get right up to the wall. You can utilize all the space in it. And uh, what's neat about it is it, it, uh, it, you can turn the handlebars all the way around and, uh, and it actually snaps into a little slot. You bring the, these bars here back around <clears throat> and uh, you can go either way with it. So now you're ready to go back down the road. Yeah, and it's geared three forward, three backwards. So either way you got the handlebars, it goes the same speed either way. You just have to be careful to know which way you're going because when you one way you're going you pull this back and it'll, it backs up and the other way it goes forward okay. but when you got the handlebars up opposite direction it's the opposite okay so this is one uh component you have to add on and we've got a couple of other first before you add that we actually rototilled so you can add a rototiller to the yeah front or back of that and it has the pto and it's a quick hookup you just flip this little tab here and, and then you drive away from it and then you, you back up or push, come into this one and hook it up and then just flip it and it just hooks up to it. Excellent. And then finally we have the actual plasticulture laying machine. And it hooks up the same way. It's not hooked to a PO, PTO, but it hooks to the same place. It's got the hole there. And then you just roll the plastic out underneath the wheels and the displays throw the dirt up against it. It doesn't make a raised bed. Uh, so what I've done in the past is I've used a rake to rake it up a little bit and then lay it over. It makes a little nicer bed that way. So a fun little machine for a small farm. Hey. Um, thank you, Micah, for joining us today. Thank you.
Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, Extension Turf Grass Specialist Justin Moss joins Casey to repair bare patches in our Bermuda grass lawn and has tips on how to choose between covering the areas using seed or sod and how to be successful with each. Barbara Brown will also have a tasty recipe. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.